after recently finishing a project, I ended up with some uh, craft equipment that um, was kind of new to me, stuff that I'd bought specific to making the shield that I've just completed. I think it'd be a great idea to make a box for it. So when it comes to making a box, I've got many choices as to how I can join the wood together. I could, if I wanted to do, do a simple butt join. I could cut hand cut dovetails, as I've done there. That is uh, another form of dovetail, but as you can see, I've kind of gone for kind of different looks. Or I could go for this very simple box joint, which is cut on the table saw. I'm going to use the DW745, and I'm going to use the dado stack system on that as well. Top tip, if you want to make a box square, make sure that both the, the top and the bottom is cut at the same time, as well as the two ends are cut at the same time. Therefore, you know, they're exactly the same length, so you can make your, your perfect rectangle or square or whatever it wants to be. You could, if you wanted to, actually put tape around this to make sure that they didn't slip, um, but uh, I was happy just holding it. These have been cut to the same length because we cut them together. These have been trimmed you know, to the same length so we know this, this is square. And I've slightly oversized the dimensions in order to accommodate for the fact that the pieces of wood are going to melt into each other. So you have to take that into consideration as well. And then obviously the thickness of this wood is ultimately going to determine the, the height of the box. Bearing in mind that the box will be shorter than that ultimate height, and the reason being is that once we've built the box, we're going to have to cut the box in order to have one, you know, a bottom to the box and a top to the box, and, and the thickness of the kerf of the blade is going to subtract from the overall height of the box. And depending on whether or not we recess the floor of this material into the base of this box, that would further reduce the height of that box. This is one of the short pieces of wood, so it's one of the ends. And if I put it in the vise and put that flat uh, straight edge there, you can see that there's light on the left and light on the right of it. If I get my arm out of the way so you can see, oops, behind me. Can you see the light? And it effectively rocks like that. Which means that there's like a high spot down the middle. Which means that when we turn it over, There'll be high spots on either side of it here, so I want to trim off the very minimum of, of this really. This is not something I want to do, it's something that I have to do, because I want to make the wood obviously flat and square for the, uh, for the box jointing process. So I'm going to draw a line with a pencil down the middle. So I'm going to advance the blade. just starting to bite now and I can see that the plane is cutting directly in the middle I don't know if you can see that can you see that the shavings are directly in the middle so that's good so I'm just going to advance it a hair more I'm going to put a little bit of wax on which is going to help with the surface friction So just a little bit more. So there is shavings coming off this, but all I want to do is to take enough in order to make this flat. So I still need a bit more. I've kind of I've kind of flattened it now to about there, I would say. So if I put a line down that side and down that side, if I now go over it again, just slightly advancing it, That's now completely flat, that's completely flat, and that's completely flat. So again, I'm going to lightly put a pencil mark 
a straight line on either side. And then plane it until that line disappears. Check that. You've actually got a high spot there in the middle. So I reckon that'll take care of that. does. So the bottom one has been done and the top plank, I don't know if you can see it, but if I put that against it, I can kind of rock it a little bit. So the remainder of the boards get the same treatment. Um, you have to wonder actually, why I didn't use a better wood and uh, in retrospect, <laughs> I wished I had, but um, this is what I had and uh, this is what I bought. So uh, I think this is just uh, you know the, the the usual strip pine, I guess, that you get from the hardware shop, um, and I bought it and um, uh, left it in the house to acclimate. But um, it was pretty pretty gnarly and twisted stuff. So this first piece of wood I'm showing here, that is an off cut that um, is kind of hasn't been jointed, and you can see how crooked it is. And these are the uh, the boards that we've just worked on, and they're now completely square and uh, and flat, which is um, essential for the next process uh, of cutting box joints. There's a lot of videos out on YouTube about how to cut box joints. I have my own video called Dewalt Seven Four Five Cutting Dados, in which I uh, demonstrate and explain how you can take uh, two standard. To what blades and a thin curved blade put them together which allows me to cut these um, seven millimeter cuts in one go and uh, there's also one called workshop tour and that shows pretty much the same thing we've got some fluff on the back of this so i'm going to clean off the fluff that we've got on here and then we'll do a dry fit both the top and bottom and the sides get cut at the same time so you only actually get a burr on the the backboard one of the beauties of this joint is, is that once you've cut it, you can choose what you think is going to be the face side. So we've got this, you know, we've got this kind of like uh, imperfection, uh, which is going to leak probably a little bit. So it's up to me to decide which one do I think would be the best on the outside. In fact, that actually goes all the way through. You can see light through there. That's, that's actually the back end of that. So, OK, let's say that's the outside there. And let's call uh, that the outside. And let's say that, I don't know, does it really matter on that? Let's call those the outsides. So now that we've done that, we can assemble the box. I would say it's probably one of the more satisfying joints to put together. Uh, it never ceases to put a smile on my face putting box joints together. And the problems that you get associated where you're you're making uh, dovetails to fit together. There is no pressure, whoops, there's no pressure on this. And you can see that we are possibly, I don't know, say two millimeters off. Because if you think about it, you know, if there is a slight, if that surface isn't completely flat towards that surface, it then gets amplified when it goes around that surface and amplifies it when it goes around that surface. And I, you can see that we are off by about two mil. So literally, that is a perfect fit. So I can push that together. There's no rocking. It's completely flat. Completely flat, no rocking on either side. And we're left with this excess material. As soon as you make one side square, 
you can guarantee that if I go to the other side, that will be perfectly square. So just squaring up one corner immediately squares up everything. I put this, um, I put this together and I clamped it um, dry because uh, I wanted to sort of, I wanted to push the, the fingers properly together. But these stick out so much that it means you have to clamp on the inside of it. So you kind of, you, you, you're distorting everything a little bit like that. So I'm just going to mark these and trim these off. You can see those little marks there. So I'm just going to put that on the chop saw and cut those off. If you were going to do a lot of these box joints um, and you had, I don't know, uh, like a lot of kitchen drawers to make or just a lot of work to do, uh, you could manipulate the jig so that the uh, little wooden finger that sticks out was shorter and then you could make it so you didn't have to trim off anything. What I'm going to do is I'm going to glue this box together, make sure that it's square might use a clamp to just initially squeeze the joints together and then release the clamp. And then once that's been done and this has dried, I'm then going to cut a sheet, oversized, stick it on the top, stick it on the bottom, put a weight on it with no nails in at all, stick the whole lot together, and then take a flush trim router bit hard up against this edge to cut the uh, board on the top uh, against it. So that way I'll get the maximum depth maximum size of box that I want and it will be the easiest way and there's going to be no nails in it. So although I said you don't need to use clamps, um, I do and you'll see me use them. Uh, this is Type Bond 3 that I'm using, it has a longer drying time and even with a longer drying time they end up getting quite stiff so you can see me bashing them together with a hammer and bucket of water uh, is always on uh, side to clean them up. The Bessie clamps are, are really there to squeeze them, the joints together uh, in order to make them look pretty. Now that I've taken it out of the clamps, it's now time for me to sand down the edges that you can now see here. And they're a little bit proud. Bearing from the flush trimming bit is going to ride against this. So if we've got bits sticking out here, then the bearing's going to ride against that, which means that the, the corners are going to have like a bit of an odd shape to them. So time to smooth this down. And what I meant exactly by that was that the bearing from the flush trim router bit is going to uh, mimic any imperfections and and so it's absolutely critical that we get it smooth uh, and flat on the corners so you can see there where it's been sanded and there where it hasn't and those little remaining nodules that are sticking out would mean that the flush trim bit would register against that and would give you um, a distortion when it came to the corner so I'm very lightly just taking off uh, some glue on the top. So now with these lovely corners, uh, it means that the uh, the bearing on the flush trim router bit will register, giving you very nice, clean, square corners. Now it just so happens that the side of this sheet of plywood that I want to use, the nicest side, is the one that's got the price tag on it. And it's really horrible and difficult to get off. And because the veneer on plywood, I mean this is 5mm plywood, it's so thin, it, you don't really want to sand it. So this is um, a cabinet scraper. And that... Uh, the cabinet scraper is, I always think of it as a, a tool from a bygone era. And can imagine that it was used to, you know, get beautiful surfaces on dining room tables and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a very difficult tool to sharpen. There are a lot of very useful videos out there, but uh, effectively you're um, grinding a smooth edge and then you're, uh, with a special tool, you're actually putting a, a bevel on it, which creates a, a sharp um, burr. And it's that that you're using to scrape off um, any, um, any wood. And you can get some really fine shavings out of it. It was late in the day and uh, I didn't want to disturb the neighbours so I was using um, a handsaw to cut this up and it was, uh, it was pretty quick. It gave me the desired effect that I wanted. Again, Type Bond 3 is being used with a longer drying time. And, um, and then once I'd done that, uh, which was easy, it was, um, I think, 16 Bessie clamps and about three G clamps 
um, meant that uh, I got rid of any little gaps. I will come back tomorrow and uh, tackle the clamps off and then we can trim it down and uh, turn it into a box that we can open, uh, smarten it all up and finish it off. Well it's the next day and it's time to take it out of the clamps. These clamps are ideally suited to this particular task and these Bessies are wonderful in as far as they have big, wide, flat, parallel jaws that don't leave any marks and they can apply enormous amounts of force. I can't remember how much it is, but it's a lot and it can be done with such delicacy. Um, so they're very, uh, they're very versatile. I will admit they are a serious investment, but in my opinion, they are they're worth every penny and they've become my go-to clamps, so um, they're ideal for this and uh, every other project I do. So what we need to do now is to trim these edges off. So I think I will set the router up with a flush trim bit and um, I'm not even gonna try and take off the, you know, this huge bit at the end. I think we'll just do it with a flush trim router, so. I think this was the very first machine that I had in the workshop, uh, an Axminster professional router table. And now you can see the importance of why the corners have to be so um, smooth and square allowing that bearing to run up against it and give you that immaculate corner. Um, for ages I would make boxes and would try and get the tops and bottoms to fit perfectly and uh, you could never get the quality of finish that you can get by, by using this method. Uh, here I am with 120 uh, just cleaning up the edges and uh, yeah it's, it's very nice. So you've got a nice box now, with nice corners, they're quite sharp edges so I need to do something there but you can see um, it looks very attractive, you know, it's a very, um, it's a very square, uh, even sided, nice little sandwich. And uh, yeah, okay, so that's, uh, it's got two nice sides on it. Do you remember we scraped off the label on that side? So we've got two even nice colours. So I think the thing to do is to possibly go back to the router table and to pick some kind of, um, some kind of smooth edge to put on here. Now, <clears throat> because this is a, a laminate, of course the laminate is going to show as soon as I go through it. So I can't get round that and, uh, and to that end I can't decide whether or not to put something that's rounded on there or a chamfer. But I don't know, I'll pick something and whatever it is it'll is. I mean it's going to be practical so you don't hurt your hand when you try and pick this up because it is real sharp. I decided to line the bearing up with the fence and then that way you don't get that kind of shiny mark from the bearing on the wood itself. Um, you don't have to but uh, I think you get a better result. So that's worked out quite nicely and um, you know you can see that obviously it has cut into the veneer um, but it looks quite pretty and I was thinking that when it comes to cutting the box in half I might make the the cut coincide with where that uh, that imperfection is there because the rest of it looks pretty good. I wished I'd hot glued some little pieces of wood uh, either side of the box before I made the final cut to save on sanding. We finished on the table saw now and um, the uh, the cut has produced a nice finish and now we have a box that opens. I would say the back of it, the very last cut that I made was probably the only one where there's any kind of, you know, you can physically see where it's been and so the ideal scenario would be where you have a sheet of sandpaper which is bigger than the box so that you can put the whole surface on and rub it just to get off any imperfections and you can get it completely smooth and flat. This was, uh, this was quite a lengthy and, and tedious process but at the same time extremely rewarding. Um, it's not often that you, you, know, you have such a big area to use for sanding. And when I had explained earlier about wanting to hot glue a couple of bridges of wood to the the ends of the box so that when I made the final cut along its length to you know split the box the very last cut that you make the box is unsupported and um, and that's where you get a little bit of the blade digging in and and it's that that you're actually smoothing out and removing and so if I'd done that I would have got a much better cut 
and uh, I would have had less work to do smoothing the box down. But you can keep looking at it to make sure that you're not working too much on a corner so the box remains, you know, very flat. Yeah, about an hour later, uh, I've kind of refined the system by um, allowing myself a greater area of, of movement so I can slide about that much. And the idea being is, is that we're trying to get any kind of table saw marks, which you can still see there. There's still table saw marks there. So I need to get those out. And once I've got those table saw marks out, we'll be good to go. We've arrived at the stage where the lid and the top are flush enough so that they could effectively be joined together. And I've got a couple of nice brass hinges here and those brass hinges we will place on the back here and we'll put those on shortly. But before we do that, I wanted to kind of give you a view of some of the other boxes that I have and use in this workshop, how I made them, and some of the mistakes that I made on those boxes, um, or at least one noticeable mistake that I've made on one of the boxes that I've made, that I can learn from and then apply so I don't make the same mistake on this. So this box is made with um, dovetails that have been cut on a, on a, on a, on a dovetail jig. Uh, which uses a router and you can see at the back here I've placed or on the sides I've placed these big grooves in order to put your fingers in to make it easy to use. If you look at the box from the side you'll notice that the top is slightly sort of inset forward and uh, that's because I didn't fit the hinges properly. So a closer inspection with the box open and looking at the hinges shows me the problem that we've got and that is is that if you take that side of the hinge line there and you compare it with that it's flush so basically that lines up with that it's almost like a complete straight line however when you look at this side of the hinge there is a small gap between where the side of that hinge finishes and where that box is so i should really have moved this further in so that that edge there it was completely lined up with that edge there. One thing I did get right is that when you look at a hinge, and this is the brass hinges that we're going to be using on, uh, on my box now that we're making, you'll notice that there is a, a total overall thickness of the hinge and that if we were to just literally cut out recesses to accommodate this thickness of brass here so that these were sitting flush, i.e. flush in here so there was no, there was no recess, and when the box was closed, if I put those parallel, whatever that gap is there would be the gap that the box would have all the way around it. So the way to get around that is to measure the total thickness of that hinge, which actually in this case is six millimeters, and divide it by two, so you have three, which means that each recess in here means that this needs to be recessed three millimeters. And that three millimetres is thicker than that piece of brass there. So these will be very slightly recessed. But the idea being is that when the box closes, there'll be a nice airtight gap between timber all the way around it. This has been made using hand cut dovetails. And you can still see the scribe lines actually in the timber there. And um, this is all cut with no more than just uh, uh, dovetail saws and... Uh, chiseling out. It's a lovely box and on the bottom of it it has a recessed bottom but it's not terribly big but that's about for my level of skill about the maximum size of box that I would want to go to because as we discussed earlier when you join that piece of wood to that piece of wood if this piece of wood points up or down by even a quarter of a millimetre it's then exaggerated by any imperfections that you have here. Even if you don't have an imperfection, it's still going to be exaggerated. Even if you just make one mistake on this corner here, and that's a perfect corner, and that's a perfect corner, and that's a perfect corner, you're still exaggerating that over all those corners there. So that doesn't rock at all. That's completely level. Another thing that I enjoy making is uh, the sort of pieces of equipment, and I have no idea what you would call them, but I suppose they're like jigs. So a closer look at this particular jig and you can see that I have cut 
very specific areas out of this. And if we turn it around, there's a place to put your hand in there so that you can pull out the depth gauge there. And you can see all the intricate shapes that are required in order to make just a jig in order to hold that lovely little bit of um, scribing depth gauge that goes in there. And then that engineer square that fits in there. I can place that perfectly in there. This is another example of um, a box made out of soft pine with hand cut dovetails. Um, the only difference being is, is that um, I was kind of watching Rob Corsman and he likes to have, um, he likes really tiny pins. I don't think my pins are as small as his, um, but uh, you can see how chunky the tails look. And one of the fundamental differences between this box and other boxes that I've made is, is that this one actually has uh, a solid timber bottom on it. So I'm not sure that that's probably a very good idea long term as um, the box doesn't really allow for any movement in width of the, uh, the base, uh, but that was that. The next time I decided to make a small box to put things in, I played around with the actual size and probably evened up, I would think, the, the size of the pins against the tails. So they're probably a little bit more conventional. And then I put um, a floating bottom on it. So that actually isn't, uh, isn't glued in, that's floating, you can move around. And that's used for uh, no more than just, uh, you know, putting face masks in. So with the boxes placed into a drawer, you can see that even the gap between the two boxes almost creates a, a kind of a special space for itself. It tidies the drawer up and it's just a neat and clean place to keep your tools. And now what I need to do is to reset this depth gauge so that is no more than three millimeters. I'm going to make an approximate decision about where I want the hinge to be. Obviously the hinge is going to be sitting down here, but I'm happy with that kind of position there. And I don't really care to measure it. It doesn't make any difference because I'm going to set up a, a jig on the actual router table that corresponds to that edge there in order to cut that first section. I would think that that is normally designed that when you're running things up against this, uh, this fence here, you can use this as almost like a stop block. But we're going to use this in another way. This actually has probably, I'd say, about, uh, about three, four, about four centimetres in thickness here. And so what I'm intending on doing is actually setting that up and then accurately measuring the distance between the side of that and the edge of that. And then it means I can cut the left hand side of the box. And then if I move this over and mirror whatever dimension that is between the edge of that cutter blade and that side there, I can then cut the right hand sides of the box and then I can freehand the bit in the middle because that's so wide. So that's what I'm gonna do. And that's what I did. Um, you saw me using a block of wood there. And uh, I just wanted something to give me a, you know, an arbitrary measurement from one side to the other. It worked out well. So with the box placed back on the workbench, you can see that we have got those, uh, that three millimeter cut in the bottom to line up perfectly with the three millimeter cut in the top. And the same is on the other side as well. So what I need to do now is to mark out where that hinge is there and put a mark on the other side and cut another hole through there. So that's the, the total width of the hinge and then we'll just manually take out the bit in the middle on the router table. So having transposed the line on the other side of this box where I want the end of the hinge to be, the other end, I have placed this engineer square so that that engineer square you can just hear it touching the extreme right hand side of the router bit and by lining those up and then setting this in position it now means that I'm ready to cut this side of the box. You can just see me here free handing out the uh, remaining material in the middle. Nice fit. It's 
It's now time to drill and secure the hinges. And if we take one of these screws, we can pull out, and I've, in this case, I've pulled out a two mil drill. And that two mil drill, if I compare that against that screw, ignoring the fluting on that screw and more or less the shaft of it, I would say that that's gonna be about the right size. But to make things even better is if we start off with this self-centering drill brick called a Vix bit, it means that that, that countersinked uh, retractable section on the top of the drill means that when I place that over the top of the hinge, it's forced to centralize the drill bit. So I can get that started and that's very slightly bigger and then I can replace it by drilling to depth with that before inserting the screw. So having planned this to death and explained what I'm going to do, you'll see that this uh, all goes horribly wrong. Um, although I, even though this didn't work out, uh, and you'll see why, because I, I show you and I explain to you how it went wrong, um, I'm, quite, uh, I'm quite pleased with the end result, but um, uh, my Vix bit didn't work. After all that being Mr. Smarty Pants, <laughs> I managed to get the holes very, very slightly in the wrong place. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to over drill the holes. I'm going to stick this, actually it's, this is bamboo. I'm going to shove that in, cut it off and then uh, re-drill them. These are like giant cocktail sticks that you buy in the uh, supermarket. Ideal for kebabs and such like. But being made of bamboo, they're uh, ideally suited to this task and um, just useful as like pokey sticks to have in your workshop. So with that repair done, you can just see down there how slightly off centre those little dowels are that I banged in. So I've put that screw in on, on the right and that should hold it while I use the fix bit. There's the other side where I filled in all three and they're completely smooth and rock hard and I can drill straight into that again now. The screws that were supplied with the hinges were uh, really awful and as I was screwing them in by hand, with the right size screwdriver, uh, I could feel it, you know, wanting to almost tear the heads. Um, uh, at this point, I'm relying on a really sharp drill and um, drilling in at, you know, whatever angle is necessary to force the, um, the holes into the right place. And uh, it worked out. So you'll probably notice that I abandoned the Vix bit. And if I show you this, can you see it's off centre? So it wasn't drilling a hole as it should do. So with that task complete, um, any minor overhang that you get from the imperfections of how the hinges have, um, have gone on can be taken care of. So you can see I'm clamping it together there just to uh, make sure that uh, the orbital sander doesn't uh, push the box around as you're sanding it because you know it's quite a violent thing and just cleaning all the edges up after the disappointment of putting the hedges in the wrong place which is kind of like one problem leads to another i had a bent vix bit that meant the hole was off center i then repaired that by putting in uh, little dowels made out of bamboo then when I went to re-drill the hole, because obviously the bamboo is harder than the softwood, it meant that the, uh, the drill was diverted away from the hardwood towards the softwood, so I've been fighting a bit of a losing battle. However, being a good carpenter isn't really about getting it right all the time, it's actually probably more important to know how to fix it when it goes wrong, because really fixing problems is, I think, really the, the key to progression. And so now, having gone round, as you saw on time-lapse, I went round with the uh, random orbital. I've uh, smoothed up all the edges. So we've got a box now which is extremely um, smooth on the outside. Everything fits perfectly. There's no, there's no uh, lip where, the, where the, the top overhangs in any way. So we kind of cheated. And when we open the box up, we've got uh, a lovely interior with plenty of space for all the things that we want to do. And more importantly, all the uh, all the, the mash that we did and setting up the half the thickness of this and uh, routing that out means that we now have perfect contact all the way around. And that's always a bit of an irritation with me. If you actually see a gap in a box, it's, it's not very good. So if I close this box now, 
just makes that reassuring thump sound because the air is being pushed out. It's actually like a cushion of air because it's got complete contact all the way around. So you've got contact absolutely everywhere. Now time to place the, uh, the catches on. And then after that, uh, it'll be about organising the inside of the box, possibly um, some kind of stain. I wished I'd done these catches in brass to match the hinges. So what I've been doing here is I feel that this catch lock, I think it should sit on the front of the box directly opposite the centre of the hinge. So I'm just setting this up, which means that when I go to the front of the box, I can put that in the right place. And conversely, when I turn this around, I can set the other side as well. So that way I know I can put the, uh, the locks, or the catches in the right place on the front. The catches um, required small screws that I bought for it. And they were so small I thought I could get away. And I did, uh, without pilot uh, drilling it first. You'll see me shortly using a hammer. And that's because the, the, the section of the catch that faces the box had a little lip on it. So it just needed to be pressed in. So with the little catches complete... We now have a smooth, flat, perfectly square box. And as you remember, we, we worked out that we could put the catches so that they oppose the hinges. I think that makes sense. They're a bit stiff, which I think is probably better than loose. We'll open those up. It's nice, the box actually, there's enough stiffness in the hinges for them to remain like that, although I don't think that would last for long. And then the box closes beautifully and then it locks. So that's, uh, that's going to keep the contents uh, safe. So the next job really is for me to decide whether or not I want to partition certain sections off on the inside for putting tools like, um, I don't know, scalpels. I can put those in one little place and I can put paintbrushes in another and uh, um, size, which is the little liquid bottles that we use for sticking on the gold leaf. Uh, and I need to put some sort of stain on that as well. So those are the next things to do. To me, this is probably where the fun really begins because you can be really creative in, in your design as to deciding where you're going to put your partitions and how you're going to separate the box off. Having cut just a couple of strips of wood, which are pretty much the same height as the uh, the base of the box, then what I did was I bundled together a whole, uh, a whole load of these and cut these all at the same time. Uh, and by doing that, I now know that they're all exactly the same size. So now that I take the tape off, So that's an excellent method for creating uniform pieces of timber and so these are all acting as you know really nice little spaces and um, these are acting as dividers separating off as you can see here the paint brushes from the sharp knives and the, the paint pots and um, it's a very um, rewarding thing to do um, just making these bottles of size fit in one compartment and then separating out leaving another it's great. I enjoy this process. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's creative. So that's a, a simple way. So the only problem I've got now is, is that if I'm, I'm trying to reach down in here to get this out, is that going to be a problem? So, um, oh, that's good. They can go in there. And little bits and pieces. So let's just see. Yeah, I can still get that out as well. So the thing to do now is to take that out and just put a little bit of glue I'll probably I'll probably make sure that these are um, exactly the right size by gluing stuff into position actually while everything is here. In retrospect, if I was going to make another one of these boxes, I would have cut the um, strips of wood so that they were recessed uh, below the height of the of the box opening because they're probably about a millimetre under. But I've 
recessed them more and then that way I could have cut some very, very thin strips of hardwood and glued them over the top to uh, cover up the edge of the plywood. Now that everything's glued into position, I've uh, gone around with a, a little engineer's square to make sure that um, these partitions are both square and plumb. And then using this small little ruler, I can scrape any uh, excess glue that I can see. And I've been around and done it already, but that's, um, that's a good way of getting all the, uh, the glue out so it's nice and clean. So we're pretty much at the end of the project now. Um, it's finishing touches and I am sanding the box and uh, noticing that I've got all these little voids in the plywood. As you can see there. Um, but there were a couple um, actually in the softwood and the more I looked at it, the more I wished I'd used a, you know, a better piece of wood. And I'm very jealous of the, the the timbers that you have available to you in the US, um, in the UK. We can get hands on um, oak, but it's ludicrously expensive. And I thought it was completely over the top for a job like this, which is which is why I just I just dealt with what I dealt with. But um, it would be nice if I could get my hands on um, uh, a kind of an in-between wood. Poplar would be nice, um, but uh, that too is expensive and very difficult to get hold of. So we've sanded this down inside and out and we've gone over it with 120, 180, 240 and 320 and I just fired four really long nails into here and so this acts as a nice little place to, to rest it when it's being painted. So the first thing I want to do is to actually paint this thing kind of upside down so it's not resting on nails and then once it's been painted upside down I can then flip it over. I think everyone will agree that um, putting on stain is, at this stage in the game, is wonderful. You can really see the wood pop. And um, I've become a bit of a fan of Danish oil in recent days. Uh, I love its resistance to water. I love the fact that it's really easy to use. It dries very quickly and it, and it, it doesn't leave that kind of sticky residue that you get from varnish. And you can put on quite a few coats. And I do. Um, it was about this stage when I was thinking how nice it would look if the inside of the box had some green felt on it. So um, I think that night on, um, on eBay I ordered some. And so I wanted to put a coat of uh, Danish oil on the inside so that I could sand it down afterwards and there would be, uh, there'd be a hard, smooth, non-porous surface for the self-adhesive felt to stick to. And um, I have... Subsequent to the coat that you can see there, I've put several coats on it uh, on the outside and probably about four or five on the face. So that's after a coat of Danish oil. Uh, I need to let that dry. So this was the box that you saw earlier where I showed you how I'd made a mistake on the hinges. Um, but I wanted to show you because it's a further example of, of how you can make a box with a specific purpose. And this was to uh, hold and maintain and keep safe all of the jigs and the attachments that go with the, uh, the dovetail jig. And uh, without this box, they would literally still be left in some polystyrene, which would be intolerable and it would be take up too much space. So this is a, a much better and efficient way to cope with that problem. So the felt's turned up and uh, you can see me wrapping it around a broom just to um, take some of the curl out of it. Uh, I'm unfamiliar really with uh, this this process so uh, I I was learning as I was doing it but it's 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 relatively easy. You just you know cut it out to size and and uh, peel the back off which is uh, a lot harder than it looks because it's, it's it's very very um, very fiddly and then I kind of like developed this technique uh, after realizing that the back of the, the felt was uh, was quite elasticy, and you could see where um, having sort of pulled it I've got little bits that have gone up the side so I'm cutting it off with a knife and then using um, like a credit card to push the I suppose you'd call it the nap of the of the cloth back down again uh, just to make it kind of like neat um, 
and just picking up the little bits there. I did do this years ago, um, but the different felt was, uh, it wasn't self-adhesive, it was just literally green felt. This is the inside of the box and I suppose you could say, well, wouldn't it be easier if you did the whole base first and then put the wood in? Well, yeah, it probably would be, but then you wouldn't stick the wood to the, uh, the wood wouldn't be stuck to the bottom of the base, so it wouldn't be very secure. So I think you're really forced to do it this way. It was lucky because the remaining piece was actually a perfect fit. And um, I think I'm speeding up here because uh, I'm starting to get the hang of it. And I'm actually using a block of wood that's uh, been cut off on a chop saw to push down and get really perfect edges. You can see that really glossy top that's had about six coats. And um, yeah, I'm really proud of it. It's, uh, it looks lovely. And it's gonna be a nice place to store stuff. And uh, you know, you can imagine if I'd made this using a, a, you know, a nicer hardwood on the outside, it would have, um, it would have been more pretty, but I'm very pleased with the way it turned out. Very pleased. So um, all that's left to do really is just to put my uh, my bits inside it. It's nice to know that you can just take cheap 5mm plywood and get it to look so pretty. And the pine doesn't look bad either. <laughs>